got a bit of a puzzle on our hands this week. Hundreds of Roman finds have turned up in this Suffolk field. Things like this Roman key end. It's really beautiful, isn't it? But so far, there's no evidence of any building to go with all the finds. The farmer who owns this field would love to know, was there once a fancy Roman door to go with this key? Time team, I've got just three days to find out. It's a very square field, isn't it? Yeah, and um, in, in relation to some of the other field boundaries, which are rather rather kinked and bent, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no reason, of course, why it can't reflect the um, you know the Roman site. So the, the boundary of the field might actually be the same as the boundary of whatever Roman thing this is. That's right, because you know a lot of East Anglia has got uh, early field systems. It doesn't have the common fields. It doesn't have uh, late enclosure in a lot of it. So it might well reflect uh, you know the, the actual layout in the middle. Why have you dug the trench slap bang in the middle of the field? Well, that relates to the, the geophysics, uh, their first sort of trawl across the area, which has produced a lot of, of sort of dark lines on their plot. And uh, we're anxious really to see what those marks mean. The first geophysics information is in the process of being superimposed onto this aerial photo of the field, which has got some intriguing rectangular crop marks. It's slightly bigger. Yeah. No, that's a pretty good match. It is actually quite a good match, because they're really Can quite thick. Can we sharpen thick. up the detail on the photograph at all? Because it's fading. Adrian Thorpe, the farmer, has naturally become very interested in archaeology and is understandably keen to see the first geophysics results. At the moment, we've simply got plotted data from the geophysics survey, um, which is showing magnetic anomalies in the soil. Um, but we are actually, at the moment, um, putting in a trench across two of these lines to find out what is showing under the ground. All the geophysics can tell us is it looks as if there's something interesting here that might be a ditch or something. Our first trench will allow us to test the geophys results while they provide us with a full survey of the rest of the field. Not too bad, actually, Mick. We're uh, we're taking out the ditch section now. Over. Oh, so that means that the geophysics is actually showing up some ditches then. Over. Well, it's showing up one, but not showing up the other. So uh, that might give them something to think about. Over. Well, already with bits of first and second century Roman pottery showing up, it looks like we're not going to be short of finds this weekend. But what's remarkable about the finds from this field is that they're almost exclusively Roman. It is beautiful, that verdigris, isn't it? It's fantastic that it's, uh, that it's um, bronze, presumably, isn't it? We've got the Roman key, of course, which someone's coming to look at later, and there are literally hundreds of other finds, including an impressive collection of coins. This one's got the head of Hadrian on it and dates to the second century. So if we've got this really elaborate key and we've got delicate Samian tableware and mm. some really quite elegant brooches, mm. not yeah. to mention little hoards of money. Mm. Is it possible that this key would have opened the door onto something of quality? High status buildings? Yeah. Well, I don't see why not. I know we've, got, we've got very little in the way of um, permanent building materials. You know, he's, there's not much stone, no. there's very little clay no. and so on. That, no. That's right, you haven't found no. much of that, have no. you? Um, if you look at the present buildings round here, they're all timber framed. There's no mm -hmm. reason why our Roman ones can't be timber framed as well. And um, let's hope that, that we find some more yeah. things like this over there. I, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to so find more stuff like this. I think because mm. in terms of you a building, would rather let's, oh, you know, no, Mick, let's get this clear. You yeah. would rather uh, yes. you would rather have uh, more of this. Yes. Yeah. Yes than you would more of but, yeah. yes. this. We know but, we've got all this. Yes. What we don't know so much about is the building yeah. materials. Mm. You think I'm being bloody awkward. Oh. Oh. No, this is really <laughs> frustrating because I know that viewers love to see these beautiful, yes. elegant yes. things coming out of the ground. Yes. And this is what I want Mick always to produce. All a Mick ever wants is this cruddy old stuff <laughs> because it gives you much more historical information. Yes. Yes. That's Very right. frustrating. Yes. <laughs> 
most of the metal objects were found by two dedicated detectorists who will be helping us this weekend by checking the clumps of dried soil as they come out of the trenches. All the finds from this site will be plotted by our survey team. Perfect, what have you got? Well, we've got some rather nice pieces of um, Roman cooking pot here. It's a nice piece of rim, some decoration on the outside. And we've got several pieces that look as if they'll probably go together. This is the stuff that came out of the ground this morning? Yes, it is. Yes, so this is some of the first things we've had brought along to us to sort out and clean. Wow. As you can see by the potter's finger marks inside, those match up, so those pieces will go together. That's not just pattern, that is actually the potter's marks. That's right, that's where his hand was inside the pot when it was turning on the wheel. Yeah. That is the interior. But there's... Well, with all this pottery turning up, I'm beginning to think it's only a matter of time before we find evidence of a building here. But what kind of building are we looking for? I think quite probably a basically timber building, perhaps with clay walling as well, um, and probably a thatched roof, since we don't seem to have enough tile for a tiled roof. You're thinking farm rather than yes. temple or something? In a trench, we'd be looking for maybe post holes or a slot for a foundation beam to go in. Yes, that, that sort of thing certainly turns up quite frequently. And you can get a, a, a quite a high status building, after all, made out of timber. If our bet is that this is a Roman farmhouse, is what we mean that there were Italians living there with English slaves and servants, or are they English people who have become Romanised? It's more likely that a place like this would have been the local British farmers who'd been there for generations, gradually taking on Roman ways of doing things, use of Roman pottery, Roman coins. Socially upwardly mobile. Yeah, so, so the, you know, the to, new to use a term like Romana British really means the British during the period of Roman connection, really. Oh, which is a bit, a bit of a culture shock to them, though, when the Romans did actually arrive, wasn't it? But it, I think, I think we, we all think it changed overnight, but it seems to me that it changes over some considerable time. It starts, starts before the conquest, don't Well, it does in the yeah, south east, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, and we're quite close to Colchester, which was Camelodunum, which was the centre of a major Iron Age tribe that was trading with Rome mm. well before the conquest. This is where the wine amphora coming in, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, And all the drinking yes. kit and that yeah. sort of thing. So well, also, you have to remember, Tony, when we're talking about a long, we've got material from the first century and from the fourth century from this side. Now, you've got quite a... It's probably something quite different going on. That's as long as from here to the Tudor period. Yes, yeah, which so an awful it's, lot has happened. Not a lot of been a lot of changes, you know. So the picture might be of uh, a British farming family who are gradually getting influences mm. from over the uh, the water of Roman life, gradually becoming more Romanized. Then the invasion takes place. Probably the grandchildren of that same family still there thinking of themselves much more as mm. Roman citizens until... Wanted to take up the new ideas, as it were. You just imagine the, the old boy sat under the tree when the first one of the grandchildren turns up with the toga on. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell have you got on there? You know, what's this fancy you're gear? You're not going out like that. Yeah, <laughs> dressed like that. You know. Back to work. And our first trench has confirmed that one of the geophysics black lines is in fact a double ditch and probably had a bank and hedge on top of it. But we've got a problem. This second ditch, found at the other end of this trench, isn't where the geophys plot indicated. So in these dry conditions, we're picking up some things, but not others. This ditch is showing up on the geophysics, so we know we can pick up ditches. But a building isn't going to be defined as clearly as that. It's not going to have a huge, great big ditch like that. A building is probably going to be a series of small post cells or a compacted floor or something like that. But that's very difficult for us to pick up. But from this, we do know what is as John was saying, with the depth of the, the material, the depth of the natural, the way in which strong features are showing up. Stuart's busy plotting the alignment of the two ditches found in our trench, and it appears that they belong to two different periods of Roman occupation. Our geophys plot is only picking up the boundaries from one period, and they are clearly on a different alignment to the boundaries surrounding the field today. But what does the full survey show? Do you think you have an obvious building? Because a building's what we're really looking for, That's right. isn't it? We're no, looking for a building question, which explains it, so. why these finds are here. Yeah, I mean, now, basically... The, the geophysics well, we've seen so far has shown us... We've got a series ditches. of ditch sy systems, trackways, small enclosures. One or two 
iffy anomalies, but nothing that sort of stands iffy anomaly out to me. might be a building. Well, that's, that's it. <laughs> it Do you might have be worth investigating. Here. Show us something. That, that... The black lines, the ditches are very clear These to see, and, and the trackway. Probably. There's oh, one interesting the response that might just be hearth-like. Mm. Looks like a burnt feature because of the shape of the anomaly. Uh, and then Stuart and Cathy pointed out this sort of area here where if you squint, you can see a possible rectangular yeah, shape. Yeah. That could mm. be a compacted clay floor. Mm. Well, it's 20 past four, day one. Yep. <laughs> what are we going to do between now and the end of the day? We can yeah. put those two trenches in straight away. The archaeology here is literally just beneath the surface. Oh! And no sooner has the topsoil been removed on trench number two than Phil has spotted something significant. Come and have a look at this. Look at that. Crikey. Yeah, you come and have a look at this. Look, it's all it's all bits of crushed pot. There's slabs of it look yeah, all the way around. That's right. Look at the amount and of here, charcoal and here, too. Look, and, and it's bits on top of each other, look, and there's a big piece there. It's right. That looks like a Roman yeah, rim there, there, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I just wondered about some of this. Too. Bang I in mean, the middle what, of the trench at that. What's interesting, it seems to be an isolated anomaly. Yeah. There aren't a series of anomalies like this. It, it's just one that we, we've picked out. I mean, we've got a ditch three or four metres underneath the JCB. Right. But apart from that, there's nothing else that's clear-cut yeah. in this area. I mean, does this... I suppose when we've got a clearer idea of what it is, we'll be able to work out, have a better idea of whether it's likely to be associated with a building or not. Because if yeah, I mean, it's if, just if it possible is, that all the geophysics is seeing uh, is this burnt deposit, and that this burnt deposit is actually within a, a structure, a yeah. timber structure that we're not seeing. Well, on the other hand, it could be a rubbish pit in the middle of a Carry on this discussion. Yeah, let's get on with the train. Yeah. Oh, let's <laughs> get on with it. So we think we've found a hearth which must mean we're getting closer to the settlement. You're a born marksman. Yeah, that, that black stuff, spot on. Trench two will now be extended to allow us to excavate both the possible hearth and the ditch showing on the survey here. And we still have enough time today to open up our third trench, here, which, if geophysics are right, could reveal an actual floor surface. The plan for both of these new trenches is to wet them down so that we can cover them overnight and allow the water to soak through and make digging a little easier tomorrow. I thought you might just be interested to have a look at the, uh, the Iron Age coins that are the evidence for settlement on this particular site before the Romans got here. Sure. Um, this little one, which is, is lovely, is Tasciavanus, who was a, a king of the Catiavalauni, the tribe just to the south of here. And he was probably the son or grandson of the chap that resisted Julius Caesar when he popped across the channel in 55 BC. Yeah. Then after that, we've got his son, a chap called Cunobelin or Cunobelinus, who establishes his capital uh, at Colchester, what, about 20 miles away from here. Um, those taken with the Iron Age pottery that's come up uh, gives us reasonable certainty that there was Iron Age settlement here, first century BC, just before the Romans arrived in 43 AD under Claudius. So there's a good chance that, uh, as well as Roman material, we might come up with some Iron Age stuff this weekend. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, and demonstrating the continuity right the way through for some 500 years. Super. One thing we're not expecting to find much of in our trenches is Roman glass, because as a valuable commodity, it was always collected and recycled. Typically, Adrian has found only the one piece of glass on this site, but over the next few days, we're going to attempt perhaps our most ambitious experiment yet, to recycle some glass in a primitive furnace, just as the Romano-British people might have done. Gilbert Burroughs, a local farmer, is getting the experiment underway by using his experience of pottery kilns to build our furnace, which will be based on archaeological evidence. I hear you've got a find here. Can't find. F place is absolutely stuffed full of finds. I mean, look at all this. Look. It's true. This whole bag of porridge. That's just come out of here. Yeah. And it, the whole trench is stuffed full of stuff. And I ain't just talking about finds. I ain't just talking about objects. 
Can you see there's these dark features here, these dark splodges? Yeah. Well, they're in. Yeah, yeah. See, there's a there's a one that comes across here. Yeah. There's one in there just beyond you. There's another one down further. They've all got finds in them, and for just one trench, we got all these features in here. This ain't this ain't what you find in a field. We found it in a field. <laughs> <laughs> not not in it not in a Roman field. People don't dig holes in the middle of field. So I what mean, do you think it is? I reckon we got to be somewhere pretty handy. The the settlement. Really. We must be somewhere near it. So, a buoyant mood around the table as the wine's poured, and in keeping with our Roman theme for this dig, a chance to try out some replica Roman pottery. These were made by uh, Gilbert, who's uh, been working all day on the glass furnace. Uh, he's an amateur potter, but I mean, he, he is fairly professional on these Roman, doing these Samian pots. And, well, what do you think of them? I mean, I, I think yeah. I think it's, yeah. a, it's a good thing he's written his name and date on the bottom. Yes, he's got 1995 on the well, bottom. Yeah. It's nice to in see Roman the glaze Europe. fresh. Those those ones have been underground so that's, long, but it's got easy. dull. But this is this yeah. is it as it would have been really um, when made. Yeah. So, are you happy with the way things have gone so far? Yes, very very happy indeed. I'm, I, I know from watching your program, you're always depressed at the end of day one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, Angel. <laughs> <laughs> it was us trying to surprise you. <laughs> These pictures are Victor's projection of, of what the key would have originally looked like. Mm. Stop fiddling me. <laughs> so I've, I've done it now. I've done it. What is it? It's a re replica Roman lock. And I'm, but, I, you know, I'm the sort of person who can't do these sort of things. And you've I've done, done it. it? I've done it, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Which of these do you think this key is more likely to have looked like originally, and, and what sort of door would it have opened? It could be either. Um, we have um, examples of key handles like this in bronze throughout the Roman Empire. Both of these sorts of key uh, would have been used with this sort of handle. This sort of key has um, a more complex system in that the teeth here would engage into the lock, lift it, and then slide it along. This one is more a rotary key. It's more like a modern mortise lock. Mm. Unfortunately, I don't think either of those would be used for front door. They're more likely to have been used for a large chest. Uh, ah. Front doors <laughs> tended to be uh, locked using ordinary levers right. um, or latches. I'm disappointed if it's not a front door key. That's my <laughs> theory shot down in flames. I, I don't think it's so disappointing because um, there are lots of front doors, mm. but uh, chess, it means that you've got real people who've got real belongings they want to look after. This, this mm. used to keep to documents in, is it, or um, valuables? Or that anything sort of that you wanted to tuck away, you're right. going to put in yeah. household linen, mm. your clothes, yeah. anything you wanted to look after. So, so we're going to have to rethink our little dream well, of what was behind the front door. I'm afraid so. <laughs> it's Sorry, more well, what was in the big chest. chest. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I suppose it makes sense if you think about it. A timber farm building wouldn't need a sophisticated lock. It would just have had something to stop the door blowing open in the wind. Well, that's going to turn out to be. So no, it's not. But Trench 3, which, if you remember, is rich in finds, is still thought to be our best chance of finding a building here. Good stone and crow, look at that. Um, that come out of there? Yep. Another piece in a bag as well. That's the base, probably, of a flagon, a flag wine flagon. Right. That is rather nice. Like most of the pottery coming out of this trench, this Roman wine flagon dates to around the 1st or 2nd century AD. So we've got three blokes working That's here. That's right. John, the archaeologist. That's right. Ed. Glass blower. And... Gilbert. Gilbert, who's the he's, potter. That's right. And he's the man who made the Samian ware last night. Hiya. Hi there, Tony. How's Hello. it going? Hi, it's hey, going very well. well so far. We're obviously going to have a few snags and problems because uh, this is real experimental archaeology. You haven't made one of these before? And to my knowledge, this has never really been attempted in such conditions. It looks like a little tugboat, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, it's not going to float, though. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. how, how does it work? <laughs> Well, this is where the, the timber is going to go in the front here to, and the heat is going to be concentrated here and drawn through the furnace. Gilbert's left the, the front of the furnace. This is eventually going to be domed over. He's left the front open so that you can see the pot inside there. That pot is going to be holding the, the glass. We want to get temperatures of... Around 1,000. 1,000 thousand degrees, uh, 1,100, Ed really wants to extract glass. Yes, that's centigrade. Mm. So hot and we cannot afford to lose that heat. So what sort of glass or glass components are we going to use? Yes, let me show you the glass. All we've got is glass. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> now this, in actual fact, is 1,800 year old glass. This last time it saw the light of the day was during the time of the Emperor Hadrian. And we're allowed to use this? We are in this case. Normally so little glass is found on sites that it has to be preserved. But this comes from a 55 kilogram, that's almost 120 pound dump of glass from, uh, from London, found in a single dump. It is the, the, the dump, the bottle bank, in effect, of a Roman glass worker in about 120 AD. So, so bottle banks are nothing new then? Absolutely not. No, the Romans <laughs> recycled as much as they could. There's no evidence that glass was ever made in Roman Britain, only recycled. Apart from archaeological evidence, all we have to go on are images like this one, found on a Roman lamp dating to the first century AD. If you look closely, you might be able to work out a, a figure on this side. This guy here, he's blowing glass. We assume that the, what he's got here is a, a blowpipe with a vessel being formed at the end. Up in the air, Carenza and Mick are on the lookout for more clues as to how our site fitted into the Roman landscape. There's nothing in that field that's really obvious I don't, um, I don't think that we've so, missed. No. What about, is that another field that, band right, in the field that's, next door? That's the one we're very interested in. Yes, that is showing up in the stubble, isn't it? Yeah. Coming straight to the middle of the field we're digging in. In yeah. fact, straight to that middle trench that we found all the, the possible yeah. structures in. That does look as if it could be a road, doesn't it? It with does a, with look, With a sort of line yes. on each side. Because you can see where the hedge, the dark line where the hedge went, but even yeah. either side of that, there's obviously a lot more, and it's heading yes. oh, that, straight that, across the diagonal. That's, that's a nice shot, straight across very, the diagonal. Very, very road-like, isn't it? And that? it doesn't seem to be going the other side, so yeah. it may stop at our site. I wonder if that's the way in, whether it's a yeah. ditch trackway or something coming in. That would, that would be good, wouldn't it? This here looks like the edges of fields. Yes. Well, that's good because we're trying to find a field system. If we right. can get a field system, that'll tell yeah. us that our settlement was within a whole patchwork of fields. Yeah. We've got more around the edge there. I mean, that's very clear look. You've Isn't got that amazing? It's like stubble. A, I can't a, believe a brick, it. Like a brickwork yes. pattern look. Yes. Regular small square fields. I wonder what I wonder what that actually looks like on the ground because you wouldn't have thought that would show up in the stubble, would you? Would, would you? No. There's a nice moated farm at the back, look, which is... We're not uh, supposed not... to be looking at medieval. No, no, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's difficult not to, isn't it? That's the Roman road, look, there you are. Oh, yeah, that that's nice? brilliant, isn't it? That's a lovely shot a looking right up here, yeah. We well, say so straight, but it's got slight kinks in it all the way along, you know. Yes, well, I suppose that's just to... over the years over it's the got years, kinked it's... around. Yes, they're, they're very spectacular on the landscape, aren't they, really? I'm surprised you're not taking photographs of this, Nick. I shall be, I shall be, don't worry. Back on the ground, Peter Murphy, a local environmentalist, has arrived to take some soil samples for us. What we're hoping is that these charcoal deposits will have preserved some evidence of the environment here during the Roman period. Carenza's next task will be to study the crop marks seen from the helicopter. There, where's this tiny little narrow dark band? It's just what the hedgerow was. There's obviously something a lot bigger than the hedgerow itself while Mick has been called out to look at the latest find from Trench 2. What you got then? Uh, Mick, Jerry's just found a uh, silver coin cool. with the detector in the end of this trench. We is have a, a lot of bronze of uh, this late period, but yeah. this is the first silver one, isn't right. it, Jerry, that we have found? Uh, you think it's second half of the 4th uh, mm. century, don't you? That's great, isn't it? Where did he come from? Mm. Well, it's actually just in the, the top, it's in the, still in the plough soil. It's still in the plough soil. Mm. Just yeah. above the surface of the natural. Right. I mean, you say this is silver, but it's actually, it's actually quite green, bits of it. Yes, you're right. I mean, it's, not, it's not copper, is it, with silver on the outside? Is, do, do they do things like that? Mm, possibly a forgery. A forgery? Mm -hmm. What, so they're making them in bronze and putting a silver coat in them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably just me being cynical. It just looks a bit green. <laughs> I think you're right. Well, this is a find that will probably need to be looked at by a specialist. But clearly it's well worth our while checking the clumps of soil for small items that could so easily be missed in these conditions. These latest geophys results come from Walnut Tree Field. And if we view the site from the north, it's easier to see that these new ditches are set on the same alignment. We've got ditches yeah. cutting across. Same sort of ditches, rectilinear Similar pattern sort of thing, again. possible trackway coming yeah. through. But the, the really strong anomaly. This is Salisbury Cathedral. This is Salisbury <laughs> Cathedral, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, this, by the way, is the feature Carenza's referring to as Salisbury Cathedral, due to the strength of the signal showing on this plot. The question is what, what we do with it. I, I mean, think there's obviously not time to dig it if it is a kiln or slag working no, site. No. 
but no, you could just take we, the we topsoil off, plough soil off and reveal what's there. I'm getting the impression, Mick, that you don't think that we're going to be able to find this settlement using geophysics simply because it hasn't left any mark on the geophysical record. Well, it depends what people mean by finding the settlement. Yeah. We've already got it. If you're actually talking about a physical building, yeah. post yeah. holes and so on, then the best bet, I'd have thought, is expansion of the existing oh, trenches. Of the third trench. Um, yeah. Rather than starting in a totally new yeah. area. Yes. Yeah. We're going to stand far better chance by having a wider area to see small post holes. The trouble with timber buildings, of course, is that they don't leave much structural evidence behind. And as far as progress within this field is concerned, it's the pottery finds from our hearth in Trench 2 which are currently generating the most interest. Ah. Mm. It's rather a... Oh, that's nice. Oh, look. Nice, yeah. Well, I never... Oh, it's a really it big right. <laughs> Well, may not come out in one piece, but it's... Oh, there in one piece. Oh, good God. Gorgeous. Has it got a... Oh, it's still going. Look, it's still going. Gone. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> look at that. Try not to get too much drool on it, <laughs> will you? <laughs> Ah, ah. Oh, wow. ah, look, it's still going. Is this Roman or is this pre-Roman? It will be that, that pre-Roman style type fabric. It's uh, the Belgic, they tend to term it Belgic poetry. Uh, they loved all these curves and shapes and carinations. Uh, whereas the Romans were much more, <laughs> much more sensible people, and they tended to cut all this out and get straight on with the with the round balls. When but you say is, almost pre-Roman, uh, well, it, it could have overlapped. This could well be a, a transition period between the, uh, the Romans coming and perhaps uh, between what 40, 60 AD, 80 AD. But it's certainly very strongly native. So is this the period of Boadicea? Well, yes, <laughs> to the north of here. Uh, I mean, she goes up the spout in the uh, revolt of AD 60. And we're on the boundary here between the Icani, the Catuvalauni, and the Trinovantes. This is a three different... Tribes. Celtic tribes. That's right. Uh, and when Bodicea's revolt takes place, she manages to raise the Trinovantes in sympathy to march on Colchester and, and on London uh, and massacre, according to Tacitus's estimate, 70,000 people citizens and the like. I mean, it so was when, murder and mayhem coming through here. <laughs> so, so when uh, Boudicca Bodicea lost, presumably the Romans would have come here and, uh, and could have smashed up this place. Yeah, I mean, the cause of the revolt was really uh, that the Romans had maltreated Bodicea, uh, Boudicca and her two daughters. Boudicca had been whipped and the two daughters had been raped and they dispossessed all the royal family of their lands and estates and quite naturally, uh, the Icani revolted. And of course, when almost the inevitable happened and the might of Rome really reasserted itself, retook control and presumably ruled this area with a much, an even harder iron hand than had been the case before. So the farmers who lived around here could well have been the descendants of people who'd fought in Boudicca's revolt. Or who the Romans put in to displace them as being more loyal. Yeah. Well, this is a bit of a surprise. I'd expected that we would have found evidence of the last Romano-British settlement here. But this pottery could mean we're finding evidence of the earliest phase. <laughs> you hope it doesn't all fall in in the first two hours, eh? So it is beginning, actually. It works. It works! Yeah. <laughs> what we've got to do is, is treat the kiln, um, and it's not even dry, we've got to treat the kiln as if it were a piece of ceramics. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the first few hours. That's right. They're crucial. crucial They're crucial. Otherwise, uh, what we'll do is split the thing apart. I don't know if anyone's told Phil, but he'll be expected to be there around midnight tonight when our newly cleaned Roman glass goes into the furnace. Jude. Yeah. Look at that. Oh. So Good God. Butt beaker. Isn't it? Yeah. Butt beaker in there? Yeah. What's wow. a butt beaker? A butt beaker 
is a first century pot that's sort of that shape that you could fit a lot of beer in. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my sort of pot. <laughs> Have you got any idea what these clay, red clay things are? I mean, it's all a bit reminiscent of how you make pots with, with fired clay bars. There's a lot of charcoal around. Yeah. What do you mean by fired clay bars? Well, a bit like the sort of prefabricated blocks to put inside something that where, you, where you're firing something. So, like, if you're making a pottery kiln, you've got a basic shape, and inside you'd have pre-fired clay bits to stack the pots on. Do you think that means that this wasn't just an ordinary farm settlement but might have been a specialised place for making things? Or do you think it's just that any farm would have had lots of little industrial processes going on? It's very hard to tell, but... I do wonder if they've selected the site because it would be good for industry, yes, in that we're up, we're in a, a wooded area, so perhaps they've chosen to put a mainly industrial settlement with a bit of farming as well. Yeah. yeah. So, important evidence here in Trench 2. But I'm disappointed to report that we still have no sign of a building in Trench 3, despite the fact that all the finds tell us there must have been one close by. Hopefully, by extending this trench, we'll have a better chance of finding it. But I do feel I'm beginning to develop a clear picture of the people who lived here, and it's items like these brooches which really help. This one is probably the fanciest. You can see that the whole of the surface has been covered in silver or tin, so the general effect would be of a much more expensive brooch than it was in reality. Usually if you hear about a site that's got lots of jewellery on it, you think immediately of wealth, but you're saying this is much more Christmas cracker yeah, yes, it is. Yes, uh, it may be that what we're talking about here is the sort of thing that um, travelling metal workers would make and and pedal round from farm to farm, uh, the sort of thing that which would fit in with their idea mostly, that yes, there yes. might have been itinerants around yes. here, or that these might have been farm people who yes. also made some cheap jewellery. Yes, indeed. Or it may be that people just kept their um, old bits of brooches and such like, so that when the tinker came round, they could exchange a new one for the bits of the old one, which, again, we know happened. Oh, Are yes. you focused? For your yes, eyes? I am, I yeah. am. We now have some environmental evidence ready to show Adrian. OK, we've got a, a few spelt grains at the top here. Yes, yes. Some bits of um, what is spelt that? chaff, mainly, the husks. Yes, oh, yes. But you were saying, Pete, you thought it might be a fuel. Well, it was often used as a fuel. Um, yeah. Well, it's quite woody. Um, if you look at a modern ear, yes. you, you'd see it, it's a lot tougher yeah. and more denser than uh, modern cereal chaff. Yes. So it's, it's got more thermal capacity, really. But yeah, just yeah. the chaff was used as a fuel, not, yeah. the, not and, the grain. And the straw as well. Straw, yes. It suggests it's not coming from far away anyway, which yes. rather homes in on our sort of settlement yes. and uh, the processing in it. Pete's yes. bought some yes. spelt along and I bought yes. a jar full. Yes. I've bought... Um, I think are rather better. Well, they're rather yes, nice, these. These are ones I've grown yes. in my garden. That's what it looked like and that's what's come out of the, each well, of those. Well, rather small and thin by our way of thinking, isn't it? Yeah, I think they still grow them in Germany, don't they, Do for they? special sorts yeah. of bread. Do they? Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's got to be Iron Age or Roman from the uh, material you... Well, I think, I think that yes. is a legitimate question of how we can be sure of the, yes. of the date of this. Yes. And I, th I think it's because it's coming from that, yes. that ditch with that, that Roman well, pottery in it, isn't it? And yes. it's, it's well below your yes. plough level. Oh, indeed, it? yes. And it, it can't be my grain that's fallen down a crack. No, no, because you, you don't grow that. Together, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> no, no. Well, we in, any, in any case, this is carbonised. It's, yes. uh, yes. it's, 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 been, it's been burnt before it got yes. into that deposit. Yes. Well, I think you should bash on with that, okay, Pete. Well, I think, well, I think well, that's, well, that's well, brilliant, well, yeah. Well, thank you very much for showing me that. You'll, you'll get some supper if you get any more out. <laughs> <laughs> so, as the end of day two approaches, I can't help but feel that we really are making progress on all fronts. And to end what could turn out to be an almost perfect day, it now seems that our decision to extend Trench 3 already looks like paying off. I reckon this is a surface. Yeah. Like you say, it's, it is just lifting off. This may well be a floor. Yeah. I think it would be really, really nice to think that that might be the floor of the building. Very early, day three. And despite problems with wobbly chimneys and a small accident with the roof of the furnace, our enthusiastic team are delighted to be able to report that they've managed to reach a thousand degrees and are now ready to charge the furnace with the first shovel of Roman glass. 
We're going to be doing this, you know, half a dozen times at least tonight, because it's going to take a few shovelfuls to fill the furnace, right? Okay, you ready, Phil? Okay. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. Door back on. And it didn't even look pop. At, look at it that. It didn't even pop. And you only lost 10 degrees. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> so far. <laughs> Oh, wow, look at that fire now. Yeah, yeah, listen to it. That's 1,050. Yeah. Ooh, we'll get our 1,100. Yes, we will. <laughs> First time this glass has been warm in 2,000 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, the sun is reasonably high in the sky before day three begins for the rest of us. And as Adrian takes a ride out to take a look at the floor surface in our recently widened trench, Phil and I are eager to see if our glass furnace survived the night. Morning. How's it been going? Brilliantly. Never doubted it for a minute. You look yeah. done to a turn, Gilbert. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> lots of little disasters, well, lots of little setbacks, but plenty of climbbacks. You know, it's brilliant. It's so how really... far have you got? Well, we've been we've been as high as 1260. 1260. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably flame temperature. I don't think the refractories. I don't think the pots got much above 1050. But we got good glass in there with a lot of bubbles in it. It looked pretty good to me last yeah. night when I left. I'm just getting ready to stir it. <laughs> <laughs> if this chimney was working efficiently, then the bellows wouldn't be needed. Two chimneys, it's now been decided, would have made it easier to control the temperature. But this furnace has done its job. And soon, we'll have the rare opportunity of trying some glass blowing with genuine Roman glass. But we still have a lot to do today if we're going to develop a clearer understanding of this site. Well, that's a pretty good view from there, isn't it? In Trench 3, it's a race against time to try and find evidence for a timber building. I mean, what is interesting about what we can see now is this is very typical of a lot of sort of British archaeological sites, isn't it? it, it it's, it's patches, different coloured uh, areas of soil. I'm sure a lot of people think, you know, we, we dig and we find walls and floors and mosaics and all the rest of it. It's one of the things they say on <laughs> holiday in the Mediterranean. We should it? be so lucky. We should, yes. no, that's right. <laughs> Whereas it's invariably these different coloured soils which represent timber buildings and, and, and buildings built of, of very perishable materials. Mm. They just leave these stains. And it, it, you, it, we just have to sort of carefully clean them, record them, dissect them to get the story out. Even though we don't have much information yet about the building we think we've discovered here, we do have plenty of finds which can provide an insight into everyday life at the time. And with Adrian's wife Jane as a volunteer, we can also get a picture of how a Romano-British woman might have looked around 200 AD. You had to remodel your hairstyle as well, and this seemed to be a combination of Roman and slightly Celtic, is that right? Oh yes, um, Iron Age women tend to wear their hair down or in plaits. Oh, um, but when the Roman women came to Britain, they yes. wore their hair up. They seem to have brought the hairpin to Britain. Uh, Celtic women seem to have adopted the style where they take the back hair up into a bun, but yes. they did seem to like to hang on to these plaits, or in this case ringlets, coming down on either side of the face. And then they used to copy what uh, later came on off from empresses and coins. And yes, these, that's right, yes. Because the, the garments themselves don't seem to have changed with the no. years. They didn't no. have hemlines rising and falling. No. The thing that changed most often was the hairstyle. And as you say, the way to keep up to date was to look at the latest coins of the empresses mm. and see how they did their hair and immediately change it. Empresses actually were very nervous about being seen to be old-fashioned and you very often find in Rome itself uh, marble statues with detachable hair pieces Absolutely. so that if the fashion changed they'd just take the hair off and re redo it and put it back on again so they never appeared to be out of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Now I don't think I'm going to change mine. No, I'm not going to change, you're quite <laughs> happy. Yet. <laughs> out at the furnace the learning experience continues and after several unsuccessful attempts to produce a new object with our Roman glass we're now reaching the better quality purer glass at the oh, wow. bottom of the pot. It's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it just yeah. looks so magical. Oh, that looks wonderful. So yeah. it's a, you, you blow the glass a little bit and then swing it to get it to... Yeah. Well, you can shape. make it elongate. Basically, we're working with gravity. So what sort of shape are you trying to make it, Ed? It's Basically changed Basically, a that. small conical vessel. 
like a cone beaker. It's going to be smaller than most of the archaeological ones that we've found. That is looking nice. That looks nice. The hotter it is, the runnier it is, right? Nice and hot. Oh, really? Are we somewhere near there, Ed? Yeah, we're very near. I reckon we got I sort of sense. Yeah, I'm not going to try too hard for conical here. We've got a nice thickish bottom, which probably means we'll have a crack. I'm going to go in for the punty, okay. so if you can just stay out for a okay. minute. Okay. And then warm up while I'm getting right. the punty. I think I'm going to have to stay off the... I'm going to have to stay off the doings. Yeah, well, try and do it as best as you can. Okay. Anytime you can come round. All okay. in sundry, watch out, because he's a danger with that thing in his hands. Yes. Okay. Yep, I think we've got it. One of these fine days, we're actually going to do this, Ed. Okay. Brilliant. There you oh, go. Oh, wow. No, you take that right. one. Got it. Magic. Get rid of it. Watch out for your hands. All right, all right, all right. So you'd be like a sort of almost like a stemmed wine glass. You could leave it on, could you? you? Well, no, because it's a very poor junction. That's the whole point. When we crack it off, it should come off and just leave the scar that you find on handmade glass. What are you looking for now, Ed? That, that I, I mean, I want to warm it up enough to open it out. I want to. I want to go more conical with it because it's just a pretty nondescript little bag of a vessel at the moment. Wouldn't that do? Well, Your I don't know. I mean, yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm just ambitious. Oh, that's, that's all. beautiful. See. It's coming along oh, nicely. Oh, that. Oh, that's lovely. Let's get to the sawdust. And the, the rim is not going to be finished any further? No, no. Well, I mean, there's no way I can actually straighten it. And right then now. just cover it straight up? Yeah, now. Oh, you see, well. that's the way, yeah. that's why that joint is made that way. So it's crucial now that the glass is given time to cool down, so it's probably going to be the end of the day before we can have another look at our conical beaker. Time now to catch up on Trench 4, which is proving difficult to interpret, but we've got various clues to go on. Evidence of burnt wood, large Roman nails, and bits of first-century pottery. I mean, it's obviously a big hole, isn't it? It's very square. It's been lined with wood mm. by the looks of it. Um, and which wood. has been burned, and that's one episode of use, and then it's just been filled up with, with rubbish, really. But we we really don't know why, no, what it was used for. It's frustrating, isn't it? I mean, it's a huge, very nice, regular feature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the wonderful amount of burning, yet it's still enigmatic for us. Oh, well, yes, yeah. Whatever the function of the pit, this is more evidence of industrial activity here. In the big trench, as many people as possible are working on revealing evidence of the building here. Back at the barn, Carenza can now show Adrian the results of her work analysing this earthwork, which is evidence of a trackway leading into our site. I think you can see how you could it's, move along yes. it as a levelled a level terrace that's probably been mm. worn by people walking along it. By studying the aerial photos, Carenza thinks she's found evidence of how the trackway links up with one of the main Roman roads in the area. It clearly looks like a road because of the way it runs for such a long distance in the same line. It's a major axis and the ditches either side show that it's not just one boundary, it's two boundaries either side of a route. While Carenza's been working with the aerial photos, Stuart's been out looking for surviving evidence of the Roman field system in the landscape. This is that main spine boundary I keep referring to, which is this one here on the map, which I think is one of these big parallel boundaries in the landscape. You see how it comes along and suddenly changes direction by the telegraph pole. You can see the whole thing changing direction mm. there. Well, if you continue the alignment that's to the right of the telegraph pole, it would go through that field there and into like, the field where the excavations are taking mm. place. And it lines up exactly with one of the big ditches that came out on the geophysical plot. It's by recognising field patterns in the landscape that Stuart's identified more Roman field boundaries still in use today. This second set shows how the layout of the fields changed around the 2nd or 3rd centuries AD and created our square-shaped field. But now it's time to pull together the various lines of investigation. First, the forged coin found yesterday. I also <laughs> think it might be a plated 
silver coin, yeah. which is just exactly what they did. I mean, mm. they, in other words, it is attempt, an attempt to deceive. And, and what yes. were the dates of, of well, that particular coin? that coin is 378 to 383. Mm. It's, it's, a, precise. it's precise. Late. It's precise, isn't it? It is yeah. precise. Well, once you've got the emperor, well, well, no, it's yes. isn't it? Well, and yeah. um, on the reverse, um, it's, got, it's got sort of birthday wishes, which helped to date <laughs> it. <laughs> 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 oh, it's nice, so, um, I like that. Congratulations uh, for five years and, you know, all happy yeah. returns for the next... Five kind of thing. Daphne's spent some time looking through Adrian's coin collection. Do they tell us anything about the site? But I would have said for a site that um, was starting to be um, come into its own sometime in the mid second century or late second century, and mm. then straight on through to the very end. Mm. Um, yes, I would say it was typical, um, mm. but not of a, a rural. Um, simply farming side. I mean, it, it obviously had more to it than that. They mm. must have had access uh -huh. to a market mm. um, because they were getting fresh coin. I mean, this one, yeah. one of Constans, this particular reform was short-lived. Mm. Right. And this coin is in lovely condition. Mm. It obviously got there. Soon. It's, it's close yeah. to After the date of minting. That would have been close to the date yeah. of minting, yeah. 348 mm. to 350. And then if the coin is replaced, that ceases to have any... Monetary value. I think the fascination of all this is that it spans the entire Roman period of occupation. Mm. And, and it, it conjures up this marvellous picture of this site that comes into existence, lasts for 400 years, and then dies. Mm. Because uh, when the Saxons take over in this area, we know that they, they probably had no knowledge of, of mm. the location of this site. They used the site as, as fields cultivated them, and the knowledge of all this was lost mm. until it started to come alive again, mm. well, in Adrian's hands mm -hmm. and in those of his mm. friends. I don't think we've ever had as many fines to deal with on a Time Team programme. Our survey team have had their hands full just trying to produce this record of the 558 metal fines discovered here to date. Mm -hmm. This is really well splendid. It's been decorated with stamp decoration. And Jude and I have been talking about this, and we think it may be the sort that you tend to get from Gaul. So we may be talking about cross-channel communication here. Are those little owls yes, on they the... do look a bit like little owls, don't they? Yes, they seem to even to have the Flies plumage yes, that's right. carved into them. This dates to the early 2nd century, and it's a lovely addition to Adrian's brooch collection. But we also have this. It's one of eight studs that would have been on a chest, possibly the same one as our key opened. But I think my favourite has got to be this, just because I watched it coming out of the ground. Here it is in all its glory, reconstructed by the graphics team. It's a butt beaker made by the British people here before the market became flooded with mass-produced Roman pottery. There's no getting away from the fact that this is a complicated site. But perhaps no more than we could have expected with four centuries of occupation here during the Roman period. But nevertheless, we can still produce several pictures for Adrian of the different phases of activity discovered here this weekend. Firstly, the early settlement, which the Complete Geophysics Survey has shown to focus here. These geophysical lines and features are the ditches, trackways, hearths and fields of a Romano-British farm and industrial site, which could have looked like this around the middle of the first century AD. But it's in the second phase of activity here that we've actually found surviving evidence of a building. As you can see, we've got a complicated series of layers in Trench 3, but we believe that this ditch, this floor, and these post holes belong to a timber building which could have looked like this. This farm building dates to the late second century AD and reflects the change from traditional Iron Age roundhouses to a more rectangular Roman-style building. So, a productive three days, and all that remains to be done now is to take a look at our recycled Roman glass beaker. It's sort of excavating for you, isn't it, Phil? It's <laughs> good, isn't it? Yeah. There we go. It was much bluer, greener when it went in, Ed. Will it's it very clean up? Oh, yeah, it yeah, that'll come off with a bit but of But that is water. steaming, isn't it? So was it worth having to miss all that sleep for? Yeah, 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 I'd do it again, but not tonight. <laughs> <laughs>